There are two standard approaches to valuation. These are discounted cash flow approach and relative value approach. The discounted cash flow approach measures the intrinsic value as the present value of an asset's expected future cash flows. The main advantage of this approach is that it is based on an assessment of the asset's fundamentals and thus it is less exposed to market moods and perceptions. It forces one to take a hard look at the characteristics of the firm and its business and to reconsider the assumptions used in valuing the asset. The main disadvantage of this approach is that it requires several explicit inputs and information, including cash flows, discount rate, and life of the asset, which can be subject to a great deal of manipulation. The discounted cash flow approach is appropriate for assets that derive their value from their capacity to generate cash flows. This approach tends to work best for investors with long time horizon, allowing the market to correct its valuation mistakes and for price to revert to true value, as well as for investors who are capable of providing the catalyst needed to move price to value, as with an activist investor or a potential acquirer of a whole firm. Relative valuation approach estimates the value of an asset by looking at the market prices of similar assets. Because valuation is based on market prices, relative valuation is exposed to market moods and perceptions. However, this can be an advantage in certain cases. For example, in an IPO or a merger, a company may take advantage of favorable market perceptions to sell an asset at a certain price. This approach is also consistent with momentum-based investing strategies. Another advantage of this approach is that it uses far less explicit inputs than discounted cash flow. There are also some notable disadvantages. Relative valuation does not provide an absolute measure of value. Hence, an asset may be considered as undervalued relative to similar assets but may still actually be overvalued, only that it is less overvalued than similar assets. Relative valuation assumes that markets are correct in the aggregate, but this does not always hold. To the extent that the aggregate market price is over or undervalued, relative valuation may be wrong. Moreover, this approach requires several implicit assumptions in lieu of explicit inputs. Relative valuation is most appropriate when there is a large number of comparable assets and when serious under or over valuation does not prevail in the market. This approach tends to work best for investors who have relatively short time horizons, investors who are judged based upon a relative benchmark such as the market or other portfolio managers following the same investment style, and those who can take actions that can take advantage of the relative mispricing. For instance, a hedge fund can buy the undervalued assets and sell the overvalued assets. Valuation is never 100% accurate due to bias, imprecision, and uncertainty. The entire process of valuation is susceptible to bias. The choice of company to value may be considered biased when it is heavily influenced by perceptions derived from news reports or tips from other investors. The information needed for valuation may also contain bias, such as when a company's financial information and managerial performance are not fairly presented in the financial statements and annual reports. Market price further adds to bias. Analysts may not want to turn in a value that is too far from the market price as the variance may be due to valuation errors rather than market mistakes. Institutional biases also exist. For instance, it is noted that equity research analysts are more likely to issue buy recommendations than sell recommendations. This is because issuing a sell recommendation is equivalent to saying that a company is not worth the money, and equity research analysts may want to maintain good relations with certain companies and portfolio managers. The reward and punishment structure associated with finding companies to be under or overvalued further contributes to valuation bias. For example, in business acquisitions, the investment bank hired by the acquiring firm is often caught in a conflict of interest since it is responsible for both performing the analysis of the deal and seeing the deal through. Hence, there is a possibility for the investment bank to justify the acquisition price no matter how high it may be just so that it can receive the financial rewards for closing the deal on the acquisition. Imprecision and uncertainty also abound the valuation process. Estimation errors may occur in processing raw data into information and in assessing and plugging inputs into valuation models. A firm's performance as reflected in its earnings and cash flows can also be very volatile and difficult to predict. 
Uncertain macroeconomic factors such as interest also affect valuation. The contribution of each type of uncertainty to a company's overall uncertainty may vary across companies. Macroeconomic factors may be the main source of uncertainty for mature companies, while estimation and firm-specific uncertainty may be highest for startups and tech companies. Note that out of the three types of uncertainty, only estimation uncertainty can be clearly laid at the feet of the analyst. This weekend, I recommend that you treat yourself to a movie that is as educational as it is engaging. Moneyball tells the story of a baseball team manager who employed sophisticated valuation techniques to decide which players to recruit and which ones to let go. In this movie, we will see how valuation concepts play out in the baseball world. And that is all for now. Bye!